I love to hear our voices together in song. Amen? If you received the newsletter last night in your email, you will have heard me share a little piece of a, a story that happened to me when I was 15 that our family had just moved from South Africa to America and as part of the move my folks told me it's okay I know we're taking you away from your friends and from the school that you grew up in and from all sorts of things but you can go back for a visit six months after we move we'll, ha we'll buy you a return ticket you'll fly out to America and then six months later you can go back to South Africa you can see your family friends for a visit and then you'll come back to the States as school starts again. So I said, okay. I was 15, I got on a plane in LAX to go over and visit my friends and family in South Africa, the place where I just come from. I would lived there for much of my growing up years. I get on the plane, I'm feeling grown up all by myself, I fly over through Europe, I stay in, uh, uh, have a layover in the airport and then I fly, I arrive in Cape Town, get off the plane, gather my stuff, walk into the airport I know so well, walk up to customs and they look at me and they look at the documents I give them and they say, come with me. It's not something you want to hear at an airport. <laughs> They take me to a little room off in a corner somewhere and they have various officials and they ask me, where are your parents? And I say, my parents are in America, but my grandparents are right outside <laughs> waiting for me. They say, you came here alone? I said, yes. They say, where is your ticket back to America? I said, I didn't get one yet. I'm still trying to figure out when we're going back, but I'm going back. That's what my, I'm going back. They say, you are traveling on an American passport. You don't have a ticket back. We're not letting you into this country. And I said to them, but I'm a South African citizen. Here is my, here is my paperwork. See, here it is. And I give it to them and they take it and they look at each other and they wander off. I was probably too young to realize that I should be more concerned. At the time, I was like, it'll figure itself out. This is my country. It's where I grew up. I have dual citizenship. They'll let me in. They did, luckily. But in that moment, I felt that experience of wanting to go somewhere, wanting to be connected, reunited with my family and my friends, and somebody telling me that there was a barrier between me and those I longed to see. That I didn't have the right paperwork. That I was going to be turned away. We're in a sermon series right now in the book of Ephesians. We started a couple of weeks ago and we shared that this book is a, a wonderfully rich little powerful letter about our identity in Christ and about what God is doing in and through Christ in and through us. We, I invite you as always to, to get your Bibles out. If you don't have one, we invite you to bring your Bibles for this series. We are going through this book and there is so much here. We're going to be looking at chapter 2 in just a moment. But in our sermon series so far, we have been talking about God's actions in Christ Jesus for a bigger purpose. Last week, we read through a lot of Ephesians 1 and some of Ephesians 2, and we looked at these three themes. We are God's masterpiece created in Christ Jesus for good works. And we saw how Ephesians emphasizes over and over again that God is doing something. It is God's work. Not by our work so that no one can boast God is doing something. Last week we spoke a little bit about 
the fact that it is happening in Jesus. And what does that tiny little phrase mean, in Jesus? It's a powerful phrase. We spoke about it could be something like, like getting in on the bus. <laughs> the bus is taking you somewhere. You join in and you go somewhere in Jesus. It's just one metaphor. But something is happening in Jesus that we are trying to see that, that Ephesians is all about. So today we're going to spend a little bit of time thinking about the in Jesus for a bigger purpose. What is God's purpose that we see in the book of Ephesians? What is it that Paul is really trying to have us understand? Remember, we mentioned how the book of Ephesians, while we, we think of it sometimes written just to the church at Ephesus, scholars think that it might have been a letter that was written to the larger church to help us understand something really important about the gospel. So what is God's purpose? Or another way of asking this is, what is the gospel? Now, there are certain Christians who have tried to to get this as simple as possible. I looked up online um, because I'd heard it referred to a number of times, evangelism techniques that teach you how to share your faith in 30 seconds. Have you encountered any, anything like this? They tell you the elevator pitch. If you've only got 30 seconds, what do you say? And I think there's moments for this. You know, sometimes you only have a very short amount of time to connect with somebody. And it's helpful to think about how you want to share God's love with them in, in a short amount of time. But the challenge with this is that sometimes it goes from sharing your faith in 30 seconds to trying to share the gospel itself in 30 seconds. And the challenge with that is that the gospel isn't something that can be explained in only 30 seconds. It's something that needs to, to get lived out. And when you only do something for 30 seconds, we might miss the bigger picture. So I looked up sharing the gospel in 30 seconds, and, and I saw one, one illustration that has been used about if you were to try and explain what the gospel is in a short amount of time as possible, how would you explain it? And this is a question for you. If you were to do this, how would you try and explain what the gospel is about? This person used this illustration that you might have seen before. They said, there's you in one cup, and there's sin in another cup, and there's Christ in another cup. And then they do this experiment. Have you seen it? Oh, I shouldn't have showed the picture. I should have brought it. Visualize with me. Three cups. You take the sin cup, that is filled with dark colors, and you pour it into the you cup. And what would happen to the cup that says you? It would get dark. And they explain how sin has darkened our lives and how sin has caused all sorts of negative consequences and how we cannot get ourselves clean. And then they take the Jesus cup and they pour it into the you cup. And the Jesus cup has a liquid that clears it up completely. It's powerful, isn't it? There's something beautiful about that concept that Jesus clears us, cleans us, restores us. And maybe some of you need to hear this part of the gospel message again today. You come and you look at your cup and you think, oh my word, my cup is so filthy that nobody can ever clean it. I uh, took my car in to get serviced the other day by, uh, by <laughs> Brother Dan's uh, family over there. And um, the mechanic, our mechanic told me, your oil, have you changed it? <laughs> he brought me a cup. He said, look at this. It was pitch black. Now, for those of you who know about oil, it's not supposed to be that dark. I didn't know, so he brought me what it's supposed to look like. It's supposed to look like sunflower oil. Mine did not look like that. 
And so he said, your engine's pretty dirty. You're going to need some thorough cleaning out for it to get clean. Are we clean enough? <laughs> Sometimes we worry about that, and we, we need to know. And, and so this is good news, to know that Christ has made us clean. But sometimes we stop at 30 seconds. And we don't recognize that this book is telling a bigger story. That God's purpose might involve even more, at least in Ephesians. So I invite you right now to turn with me to chapter 2, Ephesians chapter 2, and we're going to start in verse 11. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11, and then I'm going to invite you to look as we read through this for what God's purpose seems to be in this chapter. Therefore, remember... That formerly you who were Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands, remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenant of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. Remember there was a time where where you experienced coming to the checkpoint and saying, I want to go there, and they said, no, you cannot. You are not welcome here. You don't have the right paperwork. You are not a citizen. But now, in Christ Jesus, you, who were once far away, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. If we were to pause right here, this would be that connection between God and us that we see. God has brought us near. You have been cleaned by the blood of Christ, and you've been brought near to Christ. There is a bridge between God and you. Amen? Amen. The problem is we sometimes stop here. We say, hallelujah, I have been reconciled to God. I have been brought near. Praise the Lord. But Paul isn't finished. He doesn't finish there, so we can't either. There is more to this plan, so let us read on. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose. And I wanted to pause because he says his purpose, so, so get ready to underline the next section. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came to preach peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. Those who at one point had been said, you are outside the wall, those who had previously been stopped at the border and said, you cannot come in here. In Christ Jesus, he is bringing together the two groups and making one. One new humanity out of the two, thus making peace. For through him, we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Consequently, therefore, because of this, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household. 
In this church, there are no foreigners or strangers. You are a citizen in God's kingdom. You are a citizen in God's kingdom. This household is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you two are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. So I want to ask you here, if we take the gospel a little longer than 30 seconds, what is Paul trying to communicate? From this passage, how much emphasis is on, is on us or is on me as an individual? It's there, but is that the only thing that's there? From this passage, how much emphasis is it on, on knowing the right things in order to get to heaven? Important, but that's not what this passage is about. In this passage, what is the focus? You see, there is the God to us gap that is being bridged. But that's not the only gap that's being bridged in Ephesians, in Christ Jesus. God is doing something else. There is, if you look at literature about Christianity in the past 10 years, or just religion in the past 10 years or 15 years, you'll see a rise of people describing themselves as this. Have you heard of it? I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious. And there are many reasons why people will label themselves like this. And if you here are coming and you say, yeah, that, that, that describes me, I'm spiritual, but not religious, we welcome you here. We're grateful that you're willing to be listening in on the conversation that we're having. And I get it. Sometimes you look at religious institutions and they seem so messed up and so you just want to say, I want to do my own thing. Barna, which is a study, a research group, took that group, spiritual not, but not religious, and, and broke it down even further. They said, there's people who say, not just I'm spiritual but not religious, but there's people who say, I love Jesus but not the church. I love Jesus but not the church. Oh, we could just do away with the church and their, their faults and their, their problems and all the people in them. I love Jesus, but not the church. They divided this conversation, this, this category, up into the various beliefs that people had. And they said, you know what? If Christianity is just about believing certain things, it kind of makes sense to say that. Because those who love Jesus but not the church, they believe the kind of standard Christian beliefs, there's only one God, God is all-powerful, God is everywhere, and others, their beliefs are pretty similar, whether you're in the church or outside the church. So can't we all just say, I'm spiritual but not religious, I love Jesus but not the church, it's with me and God, the rest of you guys, oh, you're on your own. It is a temptation because the church is filled with human people and human problems. But, but, is that what God is calling us to as shown in the book of Ephesians? You know, in the Western world, we kind of follow along with... Uh, a philosopher from, from Europe in the 1700s around then, Descartes, who would say, I think, therefore I am. The, at the foundation of all reality is me as an individual, and then everything else goes from there. 
And in the Western world, our world is kind of shaped around that. Now, luckily, we have many people here who come from other cultures who have a different understanding. In South Africa, one of the words for this understanding is Ubuntu, which means, I am because you are. It's not, I think, therefore I am. It's, you are, therefore I am. And here in this passage, we see, we are in Christ, therefore we are. This key this key verse. And if you were wanting to just memorize one verse in this next week, I invite you to look at this one. Ephesians 2, 15 to 16. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. The purpose is not just vertical, but it is horizontal as well. God and each other. The horizontal should say each and other. So the key idea here is that when we think of the gospel, when we think about the gospel, we we need to think about God's forgiveness of our sins. Amen. But in Ephesians, that might be the 32nd version. In Ephesians, there's a bigger picture. It includes, in Christ, we are brought near to God and to each other. There's a story that is told about a Nigerian woman who was a physician and at a really powerful, um, uh, prestigious teaching hospital in the United States. And she came to the lecture of a professor who is sharing the story. And she introduces herself using her American name. And so the professor asks, what's your African name? And she immediately gives it. And it's a very long name that sounds really beautiful. And, and so the professor asks, what does this name mean? And she says, it means the child who takes the anger away. And when I asked her, when the professor asked her why she would have been given this name, she said, my parents had been forbidden by their parents to marry. There was hostility between them. There was a dividing wall between them. One group thought that they were better than the other. There was an in-group and an out-group, and they should not get together. But, she continues, my parents loved each other so much that they defied the family and married anyway. For several years, they were disowned by both sets of families. Nobody would speak to them. But then, my mother became pregnant with me. And when, my, when the grandparents held me in their arms for the first time, the walls of hostility came down. I became the one who swept the anger away. And so that's the name my mother and father gave me. Child who swept the anger away. Isn't that a great name for Jesus? The one who sweeps the anger away. There is all too often walls that we use to divide ourselves, to say who is in the in crowd and who is in the out crowd, walls to say who's allowed near and who must be kept far away. But in Ephesians, in Ephesians, Paul is writing to say those that were formerly far away have been brought near in Christ. Let's see if this focus, that in Christ God is reconciling us to God and to each other, let's see if Paul continues that thought in chapter 3. Because in chapter 3 he kind of summarizes part of what he's been saying before. So let's go on, chapter 3, verse 1. For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, Surely you have heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. That is, the mystery made known to me by revelation, as I have already written briefly. In reading this, then, you will be able to understand my insight 
into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to people in other generations as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets. What is the mystery? This mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles, and there, read your opposition, your enemy, those who you think are furthest away from Christ. Because the Jews and the Gentiles had strong walls between them. This mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body and sharers together in the promise of Christ Jesus. This mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, sharers together in the promise in Christ Jesus. I was trying to find a visual illustration to kind of capture what this could look like or what this could mean. It's hard. It's easier to find, find illustrations of, of, of sin and, and cleanliness, but it's, it's harder to, to find illustrations of being knit together in Christ. One image that struck me, stuck with me, was this one. Part of what is happening in the church is that the closer we draw to the cross, the closer we are drawn to others who are being drawn to the cross. We cannot view it as a, I love Jesus, but not the church experience. Because if we do, we will fall into the trap that the church has fallen into before. I come from a country where our own Adventist community could say, we have a church for this race of people, we have a church for this race of people, we have a church for this race of people. My relationship with God is all that matters, and so it doesn't matter what's happening between us. If we only view this and forget this, we will not be witnessing to what God is doing in the gospel. Part of what I think is so powerful about what is happening here is that if you look to your left and if you look to your right, God has been bringing, knitting people together here that show that we are all citizens and heirs of the kingdom of heaven. And part of what God is doing is creating a new creation in Christ. We are all equal. We are all brought together. We are all, none of us are worthy. But we are all forgiven and knit together. So as we, as we look at those who have gathered here, God's vision for the church is his vision for humanity. Anyone we look at, we have to keep in mind God's hope is to bring them, draw them close to God and to us. So, as we think about what the gospel could mean, I'm inviting you to think of ways to illustrate this part of the gospel this week. Maybe think about drawing a picture. If you are an artist and can draw a picture about what it means to, to be knit together as one humanity in Christ, please do that. I would love to showcase it here at the church because this is part of what we are doing. Or maybe think about if you were to share the gospel story, what words would you use to include this? Because this is part of it. I invite you to think about places where there may be a wall between you and someone else. Maybe it is a wall of hostility. Maybe there is somebody that you are in tension with. Or maybe it is a wall of just ignorance. People that you just don't know and they would be getting to know them would be outside your comfort zone. So I invite you to pick one person this week. And maybe it is greeting them after church. Maybe it is praying for them in a specific way. Maybe it is a person from a different language. Learn how to greet them. 
and next Sabbath greet them in their language. Whatever it is, let's pray for God to give us the eyes to see that we are members of one body and that God has broken down the wall of hostility between us. Next week, we're going to be continuing the rest of this chapter, finishing up with chapter 3 and reading through till four, chapter 4, verse 16. So I invite you to read ahead into that section. We're going to be finishing up with four, chapter 4, verse 16. But I, I want to end with this illustration. It is shared by, by a pastor. Uh, I heard a story a while back about a, a pastor, well, the illustration is that he was, um, there was a man who bought a castle off the coast of Scotland. And he was very proud of this castle. He thought it was beautiful, the location was beautiful. He said, oh my word, I need to protect this. I don't want anyone getting near. People used to use that location to spend, have picnics together, but, but he was afraid that they would mess up the castle. And so he hired a stonesman, a mason, to come and to build a nice big rock wall around the castle. The fee was agreed upon, the contractor began his work, but after a short while, the contractor began having trouble finding rocks to build the wall. And so he went to the new owner and said, I can't find rocks to build it. What do you want me to do? And the owner said, I don't care what you do. I just need the wall. It needs to be big and firm so nobody can get in. So a couple weeks later, the wall is complete. The contractor calls the owner over. The owner comes, sees a beautiful big wall and says, wow, well done. This is amazing. It's exactly the wall I wanted. And then he walks through the wall to where the castle used to be. And the contractor said, yeah, I couldn't find any stones, so there was a bunch of old stones in the castle. I used that to build the wall. This is the challenge of those of us who like to build walls. There's a pastor who once said that all the walls all walls are really just one wall. This wall is everywhere, he wrote. All of us know about it. No age or age group has gone unshaped by its power. Its power moves the length and breadth of human existence. What wall is it? Paul calls it the dividing wall of hostility. It's the wall that keeps people apart. It makes them suspicious and distrustful of each other. It kills fellowship. It breeds prejudice, it spreads gossip, it builds arrogance. It takes many forms, but it always remains the same wall whenever we encounter it. This is the problem of anyone who is so prejudiced they want to build up the walls. We think we're protecting ourselves, we're protecting something of cherished value, so we build a wall, but when the wall is built and we go inside, we find that we've torn down the castle. So, in Ephesians, the invitation is this, that we have been knit together in Christ Jesus, who has torn down the wall of hostility. We are together in Christ. What will that look like for you, for us, for this church? You bow your heads with me for prayer. Our gracious God, we thank you for your grace for your power, for your purpose. We thank you, God, for the incredibly good news that we are forgiven and brought near to you. But I pray, God, that we do not forget in that 30-second version that there is a bigger purpose, that you are bringing us to you and knitting us to each other. You are breaking down the walls. So, God, I pray that we 
accept that power into our hearts. God, I pray that you stretch us, you challenge us, where we would prefer to be on our own and where we have built up walls, I pray that you tear them down. God, may we be an example of this picture that you are creating in this world. We thank you. We give you praise and glory. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. And happy Sabbath.